Our second uh, talk in this session uh, will be presented by uh, two wonderful people uh, from a service design company, Helen. And they're going to be talking about something called Service Design 2.0, which um, I feel is going to be relevant to this today's topic. Um, this is going to be presented by Zeynep uh, Falau von Flitner. Correct. Uh, <laughs> she's a design director at Helen, and she's uh, here today with Nico Reunanen, uh, the data science lead. So uh, please welcome Nico and uh, Zeynep, and we're going to be enjoying their presentation for the next 25 minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Zeynep, and I work as a design director, as Lasse said, and I have over 15 years of experience in human-centric design, uh, which 10 years about was heavily around digital agencies and digital development. Uh, and last five years I've been working with Hellon. And do you want to say something? Yeah, my name is Nico Reunanen. My background is completely in engineering. Started coding at age of eight, then have been doing uh, data science on daily basis about 10 plus years. And, and so that side is, is familiar to me, but now I've been working in this creative uh, design agency business, and that has been a wild ride for the past four years. So let's see what we have come up with. Yes, so a couple of words about Hellon. So we are a 10 years old agency, service design agency. Uh, we have offices in London and Helsinki. We're about 40 people. It's a very niche community with a very deep understanding of different service design methods and also we have roots in academia. We have people with PhD in service design. So we are very proud of it's kind of pushing the limits of design, let me say. And how we do that actually, already around 2014, we started to think about transformation and how companies transform themselves to more customer-centric thinking. And we started to think like, okay, how design and design process can help in that uh, progress. And uh, we've been also proudly awarded by the Service Design Awards already in 2015 with this type of result-driven design and transformation through prototyping. And then in 2015, we started to think a lot about, okay, what's the business impact and how can we connect design processes to concrete business results? And uh, in 2018, with the Musgrave uh, Irish... Um, retail chain we got awarded in the commercial uh, category by able to uh, show concrete results of the service prototyping we have done and how it actually affected uh, uh, purchasing and, and direct revenue. And since 2017 we started to integrate data science and we've been looking ways how we can um, bring the best of these both worlds and today's topic will be about our explorations in that topic and uh, again last year we had a, a word about how we combine service design and data science in a client work. So now it's about uh, what has happened during those four years. Here's the uh, time timeline from beginning to end. It's four years as it says. So four years ago, uh, Helen's founder was uh, traveling uh, at the South by Southwest event and found the first signal of data science and thought that, oh boy, that this would be something. And that ignited the initial explorations within the uh, company, within Helen, that how data science, what it even would mean. So on the, for the next step, uh, I joined Helen uh, used to be a uh, machine learning researcher and, and, and then uh, involved in service design. It was a quite a jump, but uh, it was about uh, finding and figuring out what does it even mean, data science, I mean programming, statistics, uh, like yeah, program, software development, applied mathematics, and service design, what it means. Well, we started performing all kinds of experiments, tests, uh, coming up with tools and eventually started applying these learnings in projects. And then, uh, like Jane said, then uh, one year ago we were awarded in Toronto the uh, Global uh, Service Network uh, Design Award and uh, for combining machine learning in service design. So apparently it's working. And today, at this very point today, we have now processes, tools, we have software like 
project templates, how to combine these two, and um, like ideas, what it means. And actually, we have something like internal sof software like development ongoing. You could say uh, service design software engineering. So, sure. Uh, but it has definitely been a big transformation from uh, figuring out what on earth does this mean living on the hype curves on every possible front to actually having solutions in production. And what it has mean in kind of philosophy or the foundation that four years ago the idea was that there's some kind of AI, quote unquote, that solves design tasks and like figure, like kind of partially uh, replaces a designer and gives the right answers straight, straight away. And it's unfortunate how marketing around the world has uh, like uh, branded uh, like machine learning and statistics as mass, uh, artificial intelligence. So they were these kind of uh, misconceptions to begin with. But now today uh, our idea is that uh, machine learning software development statistics are there to empower a designer. The machine learning doesn't give the correct answers and the correct design solutions, but it kind of make, makes a designer more efficient, faster, uh, can explore more uh, different solutions, the solution space is larger, there's uh, management buy-in because uh, you talk the same language as the business and so on. So it's also like empowering and giving impact and credibility for design. So it's like tools, develop software that the designers use. And that has been a big change. Uh, so we also, as Helen, have like matured a lot over the years. Yes, and how we do that. So let's start from the basics of service design. <laughs> the famous double diamond you're yeah. all familiar with, where we've been thinking a lot about uh, how it collect customer insight with qualitative measures most of the time, and then utilize those insights to come up new ideas, new solutions, prototype tests, and uh, so forth. And what we have done is actually we have added another diamond in the beginning of the double diamond. We tripled it, <laughs> and <laughs> we decided that, okay, we'll start actually before the service design project with data gathering and analyze these data in order to find a scope, what matters most, where we should actually start the service design or user insight phase. And, so, and then once we have that right focus, then we can bring again the qualitative research and so, and so forth. So it's been mm -hmm. extending our service design process. And what we do, as I mentioned in the beginning, is steer the focus. Then, for example, that Mandatum Life case that we got the award that I mentioned earlier uh, was about the case where we knew different type of qualities that affects the NPS and the final consumer's um, understanding about insurance selling process. And we were able to prove through mathematical process that actually customers be feeling cared for had a bigger potential to impact a positive direction, the NPS, NPS than the uh, profession, perceived professionalism of the insurance salespeople. And when you can put this type of data on the table of the managers, then they say that, well, okay, then let's figure out how can we make the customers feel safe or be care cared for. So in that sense, we had actually much more uh, management buy-in to the qualitative research because of this uh, more quantified focus of the design process. And of course, still we had to use a lot of this designer's intuition and creativity in figuring out how to achieve that. But what to achieve was much more solid, uh, solid ground. Also, what we do, of course, in the design process with the data science is to create some sort of prediction models to understand which of the qualities among these different concepts that we develop has a bigger impact on the desired target. So we, while we do the more design process, we do also the, this, um, getting more evidence from this uh, quantitative surveys and data about are we going to the right decision or why, 
the, which qualities of this concept matters most. And in the last, with the prototyping phase, we can create some business simulations and predict which of these prototypes have a potentially larger impact on the business outcomes. So this is, again, many of these has been an exploration phase and um, experimental, and we've been actually very lucky with having certain clients who put their trust in us without uh, having very clear evidence how this works, but then with the projects and more projects like this happens, more evidence comes to the market and to the academia as well. And we will actually uh, publish a paper about this in an upcoming Servdes conference called Combining Machine Learning and Service Design to Improve Customer Experience. Uh, because of the COVID, this has been um, postponed and it will be in February in 2021. But this is basically what we are very interested to really utilize our client cases and agency work to come up with new methods and then put it back to the academia for, for the usage for larger groups. Excellent. And then uh, three examples of the uh, creative businesses, internal software development and what we have come up with. And also about the maturity of data science within Helen, it has like become a core function of the business that it uh, cuts through the whole organization in, instead of being a separate function. Because yes, we combine data science in uh, design, but we also combine it without, throughout the organization. We have, for example, sales prediction systems in this creative business. We also analyze our own employee experience data, and so our HR people know where to like put their effort and so on. But yeah, first example. Uh, the, we call it conversion analysis to increase kind of the uh, return on the investment of the uh, design work or return on the effort. So it's like a, the core idea is that uh, stop asking people what they want because they don't know what they want. Instead, uh, predict how their behavior will change when some, uh, say, service uh, factors are developed or service is tweaked or uh, some kind of feeling changes. So we have uh, created this uh, uh, tool, uh, web interface, and also the underlying algorithm in, in application programming interface, all running in cloud and so on, yada, yada. But the actual point is that uh, our designers can use the tool and customer data and feedback data and maybe even some KPI data from the uh, businesses to predict that, okay, if we develop these two factors, then the business target goes up. And the business target can be direct or indirect. It can be, for example, customer satisfaction, but it can be also tendency to return back to if you are selling some service. So it's also one example of how to very concretely bridge design and business too. So it's a completely different story to go to say to some CEO that, hey, if we do this, you're, you're uh, like, um, churn will uh, uh, like go down one, into one half instead of coming there saying that we'll develop there and here and do some interviews and we are not sure of the impact. It changes everything. <laughs> okay. Could you, Second. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you give us some sort of example of where this could be uh, developed? For instance, for example, uh, the mandatum life case that we did, we were able to show that that uh, developing the feeling of caring on individual customer basis will have two times more conversion and increase of MPS uh, readings than, uh, um, than doing anything else. Okay. Second is this kind of, uh, it says beta because the user interface is under constant progress. But we call it text inside editor, and its idea is to save time and cost. So if you have, say, 6,000 uh, customer feedbacks or some in texts or maybe even interviews, you have a ton of text. And, and it takes a whole lot of time to find the relevant content. So uh, we are building an editor that, uh, and it already works, that uh, 
pre-groups the relevant contents in text, and the designer can edit the contents, create themes, and then the machine starts to suggest you, hey, how about this sentence? How about this feedback? Does this relate to your theme and your ideas? That it tries to also mimic what you are doing. And then also, as a, as a bonus, it also computes uh, out like summaries of the uh, of the themes and the contents and the texts that you have selected. So it's also some kind of turbo boosted way to do affinity analysis and 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 from business point of point of view it's you can say that one or two weeks of work can go down into one or two days. So it also makes some impossible cases possible. And for example this tool uses the whole spectrum of machine learning this latest very deep neural networks and also some simple classifiers and so on. But um, I, I think that having the like, large background in statistics machine learning has helped, for example, to see the potential in design for this kind of tool. Mm. Can you throw in any example of what kind of stuff a, a researcher or designer would uh, put into this system? Uh, for example, uh, customer feedback uh, to some, uh, for example, in retail business or or some other business, and then it pre-groups that, that, for example, um, there's this one, for example, group of the specific feeling, and, and, and it has automatically found it because it's grammatically, it analyzes the actual language under, that it grammatically forms a coherent group in there, and it might be about some feeling, for example, about proactivity, and then the designer creates the team using the editor, creates his or her description of what it means. And then actually we can export this report to our platform that we are developing. So it's, it's, it's kind of starting to look like some kind of symbiosis between machine and, and, and human. And this is what we talk about the designer 2.0 and design 2.0. So scale the qualitative understanding of people. It doesn't make any sense to try to get all the answers for machines because humans know that I can't walk through that wall behind me, but machine doesn't know. But why should I tell him or her that? Yeah, and I think it's good to mention <laughs> that we challenge this by purely design team driven qualitative analysis versus doing it with this tool versus doing this alone. And we see that actually doing it together is the sweet point because then you combine your uh, contextual understanding as a human mm. with this uh, findings of the machine learning and then you make a different level of sense out of it. Yeah, and sometimes just making things faster can be already enough, beneficial enough. Yeah. And third example, the segmentation. Uh, we, we at Hellon segment customer based on their feelings, values and preferences instead of demographic characteristics because we firmly believe that there are older, older women in Madrid that have completely different life stories from each other and personal needs. So this uh, helps us to uh, tackle and see the personal, like this kind of uh, talk, like like almost like that you get targeted personal content and we find the uh, then then we have uh, developed a process and project template how this works we have the technology available and we have the uh, like this custom uh, clustering segmentation algorithm running in cloud that our designers can use straight from console that has been very interesting i mean seeing this kind of service design hackers using console sending sending uh, http requests straight to cloud that's like straight from future, Whew. you should come to the of our office someday. Uh, <laughs> and and then, uh, then the, re the results come back and the, the story doesn't end there. The designer takes those uh, pre-segments, these kind of uh, borders of a segment and uses their best qualitative knowledge to kind of color in all the other human-centric details in there. So again, combine both forces. And this way, again, sample sizes grow up to thousands. Uh, the CEO, CEO doesn't laugh at your face when you are talking with them because all these kind of, uh, kind of uh, like, uh, pitfalls have been avoided. And the three, uh, like in summary, if, if, if there's some message that you could take from this this show is that uh, 
this kind of design 2.0 where machine and a human collaborate together means that uh, the accuracy uh, increases, the variance of the design decreases, and you can talk business about it, which is 2.2. Two, it saves time and cost for the design. So instead of designers spending a ton of time processing stuff, uh, the designer now spends time uh, interpreting stuff. And third, uh, it becomes like a business, uh, like serious enough for business that you can actually talk what it means in euros. And our also plan is that someday we'll uh, come out with this software that, or softwares, I guess, is it plural, developing internally because, if, because we believe that if it's uh, uh, useful for us as a service design agency, it probably is useful for others too. So that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zeynep and Nico. Um, it's very uh, revealing to hear uh, what you've been cooking up over the, the years, and um, apparently it's now kind of a there's, there's some something coming out of the oven. <laughs> Eventually, uh, how, so I might ask first that, that how um, of these three things that you presented, which one of them have been uh, available for the longest now? Uh, the first one, the uh, prediction models, this conversion analysis. So uh, it's also uh, most deeply ingrained in, in our uh, design processes. So uh, so this pre predict predicting the actual behavior change with respect to KPA targets in business, that has been the longest running one. How many years? Uh, three, maybe, something like that. And how have you perceived, uh, perceived its validity? Does it kind of uh, usually deliver what it yeah. predicts? Yes, uh, tens of projects that haven't busted yet. And also, <laughs> uh, uh, the sci because I have uh, like a scientific or research background, so I also like uh, have developed it in a way that that uh, the same way that you will develop a compress paper, you have these kind of different tests that if you want, will want to publish the model. Good. Um, one sort of question I thought, it, I thought to open this up, but I'll, I'll still ask it anyway, even though it's, uh, it's kind of a little bit later. Um, do you think, uh, or, or does the, is the service design 2.0 as you practice it, I think you, you kind of mentioned that it should be kind of overall more cost efficient. So uh, in the end, have your services gotten uh, cheaper and better while you've done this. Hmm, interesting. Um, I'm not sure if we do spend less or clients spend less euro on these things because the maturity of the industry has been growing in the same time and I think hmm. they are able to utilize the services and process for a much more impactful context. So I wouldn't say the budgets are going down, but I think where we spend our time changes, and we are not le less spending time for more mundane tasks. Mm. And a bit like you know, in the graphic design world or industrial design world, like a lot of things has been outsourced to automatization, and then designers are doing some other level stuff. So it's, I think it's a bit similar trend with service design. Okay, uh, there's actually a first question from the audience, and uh, that was actually from Angelos. Is was that? Um, or imply that this apparently this is currently like an in-house uh, tool set, but do you have like a serious plans to offer this as a service outside your house or something? We dream of it, yes. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, at this point, we have a platform called uh, Aino Rocks. It's called like Return on Customer Experience. It's a platform in cloud, ru running in cloud that integrates all of our algorithms in one place. But it's at the moment uh, aimed more for uh, leadership and le leading customer experience than actually giving access to these algorithms, but I don't see why not, and that was the last slide too, like, why not that, uh, I think it will be great to give back to the uh, design community. So we'll just have to wait a little bit longer to uh, see that happen. Wait or come visit us, I mean, there's many options. <laughs> <laughs> um, then there was a question uh, from Joris Hens uh, for Nico, what was your personal motivation to join a service design agency? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the founder and CEO of, of, uh, of the... Uh, so, they were, yeah, cool. so they were persuasive. Yeah, I, oh, I thought that that would be a fun chap to work with, and, and, and then I did the transition based on that. 
Uh, and what, what was your biggest challenge in combining uh, the fields of service design and data science? Uh, by not being familiar in service design myself and, and spending quite a bit of time figuring out what it's about. And oh. also sometimes internally uh, selling to uh, designers these kind of ideas that machine could maybe help you instead that it replaces you. That's an important notion. Uh, how about you, uh, Zeynep? Um, you've been some time with the Helon now, but how, what has your been personal learning uh, story with uh, machine learning, data science, and all these new technologies? Yeah, it's been very pleasant. We've been dreaming together, exploring together, and then also putting these uh, ideas into actual project and see the outcome of it. I think this Mandatum Life case has been one of the biggest success for the designers because all of you probably experienced this struggle to convince a manager about your intuitive conclusion. And yes, people care about this more. Why how can you prove it? No, we really, really think so. <laughs> Just doesn't work. So now I think with this combination, we feel also stronger and really can f push these emotional aspects more because there is this more uh, hard data behind. Yeah, and, and I don't know if it goes here, but it, this also lets us to do kind of all kinds of ad hoc analysis too and just incorporate data science wherever applicable, like help a designer in, in some custom cases. So it, they, it's really two different sides of the same coin. Good. Um, then I have a few um, more practical questions from the audience. Uh, one is that how big data sets are usually used for the analysis, considering that the uh, qualitative, uh, there's a lot of qualitative data in okay. play. Okay. Well, sometimes hundreds of rows, sometimes thousands. It's really not about the size of data, and it never has been. I don't know where this uh, idea comes from. It's about the information in the data and the problem that you are modeling and what you are doing. If you have infinite amount of data about wrong thing, you still have zero information and you are not going anywhere. So uh, we use enough, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. It really depends about the problem that we are doing. And how about who or how and who, which roles define the data that you want to collect as a starting point if you think about this kind of the first part of the diamond series? Uh, quite often it begins uh, by uh, using any available data if they are, but uh, in, in, in like a projects that we do from scratch, it's often a designer who performs some qualitative research and figures out, the, say, relevant teams or looks at the customer journeys and picks them apart and then we, then we find relevant data and, and uh, analyze it. So, Quite often, uh, uh, designer defines where the data comes from. Mm. If I can mm. uh, add there, I think mm. in the first um, part, we many times we try to tackle customers' existing data, mm -hmm. which they don't know what to do exactly with, and they can't give us the conclusion, so we just take the data and then try to make sense and then come to a conclusion for the service design process. But when we need to do our own survey from scratch, quantitative survey, we actually start with the qualitative research that mm. creates the base for the quantitative survey. And I think that's a very important thinking between qualitative and quantitative, how it helps each other. And we don't start from quantitative if uh, we don't have any sense of what matters. We get that sense from a qualitative research, which is smaller uh, sample size than we define the key elements for the quantitative survey. Um, do you kind of, there was uh, in, in the talk from HSL in this morning, there was a mention about these um, like open data sources. Do you have any kind of, or, or do you have like a selection of your favorite databases which you usually consult when the client uh, provided data is not enough? Uh, well, it really depends on the problem that we are modeling again, but once we used weather data as part of the customer satisfaction and we were able to show that weather didn't have much to do related to other CX factors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
well, I'll take the final question uh, before we we have to kind of uh, conclude the session. Is that are you using explorative data analysis for the first part of the diamond, or are you uh, or are you already looking for certain uh, certain topics at that phase? Uh, depends again of the project and the work and what's the aim and and what kind of insight you want out of it. But sometimes if we get a dump of data, then we can totally put our exploration hats on and and start digging what's in there. But then again, if we have a clear business question in mind, then we can start modeling already uh, the statistics and math with respect to that business question. So both, both worlds world, mm. world work. And this also gives us an opportunity to go into the client context earlier. Mm. So you don't have to wait and define a clear service design project before uh, bring us in, but we can go there in a kind of mind that, okay, we need to increase our NPS, have no idea what to do, where to start. And that's a perfect place for us to get in. Great. Um, from my behalf and uh, from the audience, they've, uh, they've been enjoying your uh, presentation enormously. Thank you so much for coming. And I hope to uh, see, see you again sometime. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank that you. was fun. Yes.